Welcome to Unstoppable Podcast with Harry Sardinas, inspiring conversations with influential millionaires, investors, thought leaders, entrepreneurs who are making a massive difference with their innovative products and services and sharing the challenges and wisdom of how they sold their first million. How would you like to achieve your first million? And today we have special guest, Lucas, which is the founder of Deepcast. So Lucas, welcome to the show and tell us, what are the five steps to make your first million? Well, firstly, thanks for having me, Harry. Uh, secondly, five steps. So I would say that I've made my first million and lost my first million roughly five times now. And the <laughs> consistent step I'd say for me in the me first too, step don't is worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the first step is tends to be for me is like, what is the thing that you want to pursue that you're going to be passionate about sufficiently that you know you can commit like all of yourself to 100 plus percent, right? Uh, that's the first step. I think the second step is the thing that you're excited about. Is there sufficient excitement from others? So my background is all in venture capital backed businesses. So can I convince other investors to put money into my idea? So this is not necessarily product market fit. This is almost like, can I sell a vision? So I'm excited about it. Wow. Can I create a vision that will excite others about it? Upon doing that and you know, successfully capitalizing, which I've done a few times now, can I now identify the product market fit for my thing? And the fifth thing is, can I do so in a lean fashion that gets me to identifying product market fit faster? Those are sort of standard sort of, I think, uh, lean business development models, but they've been highly applicable to everything I've done to date. My background is very much around building businesses. I'm not an asset allocator or a money manager. I'm sure my answer would be vastly different in those use cases, <laughs> but it is very much around what am I passionate about? Because if you had something that you're not going to be sufficiently passionate about, you're not going to be able to push through the hard times. You're not going to be able to push through the times when everybody says your idea is stupid or when someone tells you that your idea isn't sufficiently large. Uh, so anyways, I think it's good to have conviction day one around the thing you're doing and decide I'm going to, in my case, I'm this sort of like, what about, what would I, would I be willing to do this for 10 years? Um, if I'm not willing to do it for 10 years, I just shouldn't be doing it. Uh, Cause it means my, that's sort of my, my threshold for saying I have enough conviction around this thing. Yeah. I agree with you, Lucas. And then the, um, but tell us a little bit more about you. Why you decide to become an entrepreneur? What you decided to, um, to pursue this path? Yes. Yes. You yeah, can for sure. find a job in the venture capitalist firm that can pay you good money. You can have a very easy life. Why you decide to complicate your life like this? <laughs> I would say it started very early because I was, you know, building software since I was fairly young. So I, though I have oh. liberal arts education, political science, philosophy, and comparative religion, I had my first blog in 1996 when they weren't even called really? blogs yet. I built it on software myself because I wanted to be able to advocate for some political positions that were very un uncomfortable to my dad. But I ended up building the software to do it anyways. Go figure. Ev Williams does the same thing and builds Blogger and sells it to Google for $100 million before going mm -hmm. on to do Twitter and then Medium. Um, I just had this appetite to build. More than anything, I just like building things. Um, and I like building things that I think are going to have large impact and, and many people will find value in those. Now, um, I have worked at a company like Amazon, for example, but I was at Amazon in the earlier days. So in my case, oh, really? wow. we'll help launch digital music as a category to Amazon, helped wow. internationalize that category, helped create a consumer cloud storage solution. But I was functioning like an entrepreneur inside Amazon because I was getting to advocate as a product manager for the thing that I thought we should build. Mm -hmm. And much like being outside of a company like Amazon, I needed Jeff Bezos's permission. I needed Andy Jassy's permission, Jeff oh. Wilkie. So all these future CEOs who signed off on some things. Um, but I liked it. There's a pressure that comes with it. Certain people thrive off of the sort of the drivel and trunky nature of high risk, high reward. So one of its high risk, high, high reward The other is like, I want to see the things in my head manifest in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, the, uh, you know, a Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger strategy to building over time with long holds on things that clearly provide value, that model clearly works very well. 
it's just not one that would be satisfying for me. So I've gone down this entrepreneurial path. The other, honestly, is probably because uh, I find it much easier to work for myself than for others, um, which isn't to say that I, I have a board. I do work technically for other people, but I tend to be the one setting direction and working with the team. Mm -hmm. So I think it's probably a, probably a combination of this like desire for autonomy, desire to succeed at massive scale, desire to fight sort of like novel new challenges and do so in a way that, you know, impacts as many people as possible. So yes, it does come with all the bumps associated with being oh an entrepreneur. God, Lucas. Yeah, you... <laughs> I'm, I'm a glutton for punishment is what it amounts to. Yeah, yeah, my goodness. You have a very easy life in Amazon, paying you a lot of money, and then you decide that no. Yeah, but I technically, <laughs> that, that was my first million on paper was there you go. I had a, a, enough stock option, and what did I do? I left to go start a start, join oh, a startup, and I left what on paper would have been something like seven seven million dollars oh, in yeah, restricted yeah. stock units. Don't continue. I just want to cry. Yeah. Oh my! <laughs> you want to cry? I, I, I want to cry if as I, well. <laughs> if I tell you stories, I would depress you also <laughs> on my stories. But uh, I mean, at the end of the day, as entrepreneurs, you know, it's not for everybody. It's always in our gene somehow. Yeah. We have this desire to create something amazing, and and we go for it sometimes even without knowing the big risk that we're taking. Yeah. <laughs> Once you're in. Um, especially in the tech industry, um, it's tough. Yeah, I invest in tech company and uh, it's not that easy. Curiously, yeah, this podcast, yeah. how to make the first million, one out of five people that we interview, we interview around 500 people so far, um, one out of five, one out of six, they are either tech entrepreneurs or property investor entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. What can give an indicator that it is easy to make money in real estate and it's easy to make money in tech. Uh, I don't think this indicator is correct. I mean, it's you can become very wealthy in tech, but yeah. those ones that succeed, yeah. Yes, yeah, the, the thing that the it's... people that show up to the podcast are the people that succeed. Yeah, if we talk about the people that didn't succeed. Then It'd be a course, larger number. Of course, if things work out, you can become very wealthy in tech. However, let's talk about, Lucas, how to make this work. Especially, I like to talk with you, with this kind of guy like you, you know, because the kind of guy like you are the people that give me the more headache when I'm trying to help them in the tech companies. You know, the okay. person, yeah, yeah, this software developer, that they are product person, that they just want to create the product to change the world. And they want to program the stuff and they put all the energy and the resources all the time in money producing that thing. And at the end of the day, you know, uh, we need to see the other side. Who's going to buy this thing? How are we going to yeah, make yeah. it? How can fit? And you guys, I'm not counting you. Yeah, I'm saying general. Uh, the developers, you know, the pro people yeah. are that are great creators, that's the thing, you know, that are in love with the pro, that are in love with writing the software and everything. So how do you, or how easy or how hard was for you to start to understand that, um, that one thing is the pro that you're creating in your head that you think is going to yeah. work, completely different ball game is the pro that, the, the market, the wants, market wants to buy yeah and yeah. how easy it was for you to surrender or to make the pivot in what you thought that I, that should be after what the market want to buy were you stubborn in your idea or you little by little you start to give up and pivot so you say okay you know what let me turn the wheel because what we have been more challenging is with the developers that they have that idea that this is the software going to change the world and they don't want to change anything. And look, it's in your head, but the market doesn't want this. Yeah. It's in us, right? And it's always the case. Yeah. So tell us, tell us. I'm, I, I want to hear. Yeah, it's fair. I mean, most people who kind of go into my background is technically the product management in software, right? And and I've been a, a multi-time founder now, but the, the roles are typically your sort of like B-school folks who learn Porter's Five Forces and they're learning Eric Reese's Lean Startup Development and they're learning the business models and practice 
then they take these roles as product managers in companies like Amazon, Google, Airbnb, Facebook, whatever it happens to be. And it's rubber meets the road with an actual functioning thing. So in the case of, so I would say that I kind of went to paid school, like paid MBA of Amazon, um, because Amazon is a, is a, it's a highly quantitatively organized, everyone knows they love their KPIs there. So everything had dashboards. We did weekly business reviews, monthly business reviews, quarterly business reviews, and we had tons and tons of feedback loops. So if we experiment with a given thing and you know, at my time there, Amazon was running something like a million tests on the website at any given moment. They're now running billions of tests on the website wow. at any given moment. Wow. And a lot of those are designed to be feedback loops. And they're, you know, maybe meant to prove you you wrong around something that you had some conviction. So I definitely believe in the strong feelings, loosely held sort of perspective. Um, that vision that I talked about is the first step. You have to uh, sometimes admit that new data can be introduced that you should factor into your vision. What I have found generally is that it doesn't change the thing completely. It's like it shifts you course slightly to riff. You know, and you're doing a little yeah. bit of course. For, and it's like following any sort of trend line that there's a little bit of zigzaggy, zaggy. But as long as you're following it, you're sort yeah. of uh, approaching and keeping the, the vision is more around like... Um, it's a little less details oriented in some respects or definitely is right. So like details is generally where you're found to be wrong. Like, Hey, I think this thing's going to go to market well through social media marketing and product led growth motions. You find that it doesn't work. So you need <laughs> to experiment with sales driven motions. And is it, you know, d dialing for dollars, you know, sell or die style, or is it, you know, hiring an outside team? Is it, does it turn out that it's actually press that drives things because you're doing, my last business was a consumer product and lifestyle publications actually was a good source of inbound for us. Influencers were a good source of inbound for us. But it was direct to consumer, yeah? Yeah, because it was a consumer product and consumers wanted to hear from sort of the places that they were used to hearing it. But going back to you, like, I think your original question is, you know, I, I was at one company where we frequently said we have to be prepared to kill our baby. Um, and this wow. was, I had a oh, very that's strong, powerful. that's very powerful. <laughs> it's a, uh, it's, it's also very macabre as a statement, but it's yeah. also very powerful, right? We had a designer who would like stress over, so he had designed the uh, settings icon on four different versions of Mac OS and he, and he, during the Steve Jobs era, right? And so he worked oh. for us and he really went into these, he loved the things he built, but he was the one who would turn around the next day and say, we're not getting any traction on this feature or the design I did is completely not working. I know I loved it. Let's go back at it again next week. And I think this is where like, you're anchoring the steps to achieve your mission and knowing that those steps can change and just being like, it's multi, there's so many paths to achieve sometimes that vision. Um, and so like if our vision, for example, for deep cast is unlocking the value of the world's spoken knowledge, there are many ways we can do that. It could be a consumer oriented product. It could be a podcast oriented product. It can be an enterprise product for brands, marketers, you know, media entities, but the goal is unlocking this stuff that's trapped within an audio format. Well, there are many paths to accomplish that. And sometimes it's the order of operations of the paths. It may be that the consumer is not the high revenue opportunity, but it's the wedge into the market that gets you brand recognition that you use to leverage on the other things that generate significant amount of revenue. But I think, you know, it's, again, it fundamentally comes back to strong feelings, loosely held. If you get new data, factor it in. I think if you listen to VCs, you know, VC pods, they love to talk about first principles all the time. It's a good reminder um, to kind of go back to those things. What is the real motivator for someone using this? So I could go on and on here, but I think the moral <laughs> of the story is you, you, have, you have to be prepared to change direction. And if you're too stubborn, things generally fail. Um, you're, yeah. you're going to overinvest in an area. You have a limited amount of time, human resources, a dollar capital, and you blow through one of them, or you make such a horrible mistake sometimes and over invest in over and over and over that it becomes intractable to the point that your potential audience is like, I'm turned off. This is not the thing that I remotely thought it was going to be to begin with. So take in the new data and, and don't be, um, overly uh, sort of sensitive about criticism or the direction that you may need to change. And I think people have this sort of optics of like Steve Jobs, for example, is someone who's like, no, I have a vision and we're not going to deviate from it. There's definitely parts of that are like narrative and mythology. 
internally he would take points of feedback and, and he would say, okay, that thing I wanted that was really thin just fundamentally can't work. The battery's going to overheat. Um, and maybe he pushed people as much as possible, but sometimes he would get information and he would change. Bezos was definitely that way when, when, you know, I worked at Amazon. So be open to information, I think is a big mm -hmm. part of it. Yeah. I think, look at you, right. hundred percent. I think the other day in this podcast, I, I was interviewing another entrepreneur and, um, He was. Uh, he asked me, "Harry, what 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 are the the fastest way between point A and point B?" And I'm telling him, "Well, the straight line." And he told me, "Harry, is the path with less resistance. Think about the river, yeah." Mm -hmm. And um, and I think that um, in the ability that tech entrepreneurs um, realize that they have to be flexible and they have to to go join this path of less resistance by adapting the product, the initial product, and to what the market is telling them. Exactly like you said, bring new data in, uh, analyze this data, and I start to turn the wheel little by little in what they they actually, because the truth is, Lucas, it never, never is, I haven't interviewed anybody yet, that the initial idea that they have is exactly what the market wants. Well, just like that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> If you know someone, let me know, but I, because I haven't, yeah. I haven't It's the... anybody yet that tell me, no, Harry, I took this idea, guess what? I start to sell it like cupcakes. Not yet, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And some of my fav favorite stories are the overnight successes of someone like, say, Jensen Wong, the NVIDIA CEO, where he was an overnight success, but 30 years into the business, right? <laughs> he struggled to raise his first million dollars for that business. Or I know of another business that went on to raise 70 million for their Series A, And they didn't necessarily need the money. They had been at it for 10 years. They had been told no consistently for 10 wow. years. E even having graduated from Y Combinator, which is known as like the, the world's foremost incubator program. And then they became an overnight success when all of a sudden the world realized that they had many hundreds of thousands of creators leveraging their platform to wow. generate their website, right? So I don't know, a lot of it is also persistence and it's persistence while factoring in all these new data points that are coming in. And like in Jensen's case with NVIDIA, they were doing GPUs for video game purposes, but then found yeah. there was an alternative use case for it and said, how do we optimize for that and sell into that market? And by the way, it's only a minor deviation from how we do chip design and how we get our wafers from our providers and how we work with TM, you know, uh, Taiwan Semiconductors or whatever happens to be. So I think those new data points coming in. And now they're in, a trillion dollar company, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. And <laughs> so, for what it's worth, some of those can also expose you to new lines of revenue that don't necessarily mean you have to give up the path you're on. It might be like, here's a parallel and there's, exactly. a, you know, you the classic example of AWS coming out of Amazon where they had excess compute and storage capacity, mm. that became a whole new line of business. Yeah. It's not like they gave, they gave up their e-com business. They said, no, no, this is like something we can do on an underutilized asset that's sitting on our balance sheet as debt that we can convert into It's working amazing. a revenue line for We're us. Using it. We use it ourselves. Yeah, I mean, it's the number one you know, infrastructure you know, service. You, you know, so... But then, Lucas, tell us the secret, yeah? What is the secret, yeah, for tech entrepreneurs there that they have this idea and they want to find the first client when they don't have credibility, nobody knows them, nobody knows who they are, they have this idea and they need that first client to, to prove the concept, yeah? Yeah. What is your secret? How do you find your first clients? You know, interestingly enough, I'm going, to de I'm going to twist your question a little bit. Okay. I, what, what I want to get at is like, I think people oftentimes think they need perfection before they can get their first client. Mm -hmm. So I'll use a very I recent anecdote, right? So I can use two. So my previous business was a furniture cool. rental business. We did like furniture e-com uh, in the United States. We were live in nine major metros by wow. the time we ended up winding the business down. But our first 40 customers... We didn't even have an e-com interface. I generated lists of furniture that was available. I composed it into clean little PDFs. I found pricing from retailers. We were buying it directly off of the retail shelves, not having wholesale relationships. The only software that existed 
wow. was to create an account for them and put in billing information. That was our first first forty customers, and I was hand to hand selling, oh, identifying friends, family, and that was the first forty customers. My most recent business, we're just now launching a business for creators, and the first part of it, it's a freemium model without the the premium. The premium, sorry, hasn't entirely been thought through just yet. However. For us, for a number of reasons, it made sense to start getting some of them paying for it. And we don't have a billing system in place just yet. So I reached out to them and said, hey, you're going to get an 80% discount on our first year annual subscription fee. I'm going to do something for you that we don't do for others. We're going to invoice you directly for this one. And when the subscription is up and working, you're going to be slugged into it. So I think there's just a structural thing people should be aware of, which is like, you don't need perfection and you don't need every piece in place in order to be able to close your first client. Oh, by the way, once you convince one person to pay for it, you can tell a second person that somebody else paid for it. And then those <laughs> compound on top of each other. And then you could potentially use those to secure additional external capital if you needed to accelerate your pace of building the thing to get them where they need to be. So I think it, don't let the like... I'm not all the way there yet. Hold you back from doing it. If you're creating sufficient value that someone's willing to pay for it, don't let that get in the way. And then I think in terms of your original question more around sort of finding them, that really is the product market fit. And it's like, what is the strong pain point that people need to be solved? And where are they? Like, where are you meeting the customer where they're at in order to get at that? Um, are you messaging it in a way that they can hear it? So a lot of this new product we're building, podcasting, I mean, you're in the space, you've done 500 plus of these, but there are many people who have not done that. They don't know the ins and outs of the industry. So where do they go? They go to trade pubs, they're in lists on Reddit, they're going to trade events because it seems like it's the place to go. <laughs> so meet them where they're at, start thinking about how you can offer them incremental value. That's like, even if it's marginal or step, you know, step functions better, make it easy for them to get on board with you and then lean into it. I'm, I'm emailing these individuals directly and I'm managing the invoicing. It's not being delegated to somebody else. So I think it's be prepared to do the thing, even if the thing is not structurally set up yet for you to automate it and, and run it hyper efficiently, because you got to get the dollars in the door to prove that there's a thing there. They're paying. I have proof. Now let's get the motions in place to support it on sort of being able to sort of increase scale of it and automate it and everything else. Yeah. So look about, tell us why you drive, because you already have opened and exit several business. You clearly don't need the money. So wh why are you working? Why are you not in a beach in Hawaii? Uh, yeah. Good weather and under the sun. Uh, you already know what is the nightmare to open a tech company. You already been there, done it, exited. And then you go again and again. Yeah. So te tell me, what wh yeah. why are you doing that? It, it definitely goes back to the, it goes back to the high risk reward. So there probably is to your point around our, our entrepreneurs like born or are they raised? Uh, is it nature? Or is this it is what we do, right? Yeah. And it is we very, I, like is some people are like, well, I'm going to, I'm going to retire at 60. I was like, I, I just don't ever anticipate retiring. Like I look at say a Warren <laughs> Buffett or Char Charlie Munger, you know, at a hundred when he died. And I think like, that's, that's a life that sounds good to me. He had, <laughs> he made a commitment to time with family. He did philanthropic efforts, but he continued to hustle on the business that they had built, whatever, 60 years prior. And I don't know, that's just the nature I am. And there's the other part of it, Harry, is remember, like, there's partly what motivates me are problems to be solved. Mm -hmm. there's there's no shortage of problems. So identify oh. a new problem and say, what is a way that we can potentially solve this problem in a way that benefits people and ideally benefits people at scale, whatever it happens to be, whether it's creating wealth for them or you know sustainability or I don't know, the, the list of things are, are endless. So I just, I love finding problems and solving problems and, you know, especially things that feel like intractable or too challenging. It's like, okay, cool. Well, I don't think that's true. <laughs> so let's get the ball rolling on testing at the very least. I may find that it's not, you know, it is true. And like, I've also started a business and wound it down in three months because I realized like the market wasn't interested in it. I, I got enough <laughs> feedback loops and said, it's not going to work. Tell yeah, I, told... if I tell you a story, you, you, I will depress you. So let's don't go there. <laughs> business. <laughs> I started once I have an idea to open the first halal Spanish restaurant in Brick Lane in London. And uh, long story short, I lost two years of my life and 200,000 
<laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, it and it didn't work. It was way too early. The, uh, I have this brilliant idea. I don't know from where, you know, uh, I learned a big lesson there about number one, you know, they said, no, this idea is so unique that nobody, you know, maybe because there is no need for it. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so I thought that, uh, that, the, <laughs> that it was a great idea to create. A, I don't know if you've been in London, Brick Lane is yeah. an area that, you know, they sell a lot of spicy food and everything. Mm -hmm. and I thought that was a good idea to come to this to this street with the alternative food. Yeah. Guess what happened after two years of me being there, after I left, everybody went in. Now 50% of break lane is at the exactly time. that but i was way too early and was painful expensive and i couldn't make this <laughs> the thing work also i lost my business i lost the money i lost my girlfriend back then i also my yeah. own business almost called out because of that thing anyway total disaster but the whole point is i learned persistence yeah, I learned a lot. I think now in London, when people say, no, I'm going to spend a lot of money in the MBA, I'm telling them, look, open a restaurant. You will see this is the best MBA that you can have. Yeah, you're, <laughs> you're, you're, you're I was going to say, you're studying marketing and cost of goods sold and Everything. cost of sales. And... Oh, my God, the restaurant, oh, customer acquisition, the ways, the... Uh, sometimes I, I ask the restaurant owner, man, if you're making profit, you're making money with this thing, what are you doing doing this thing? You're clearly passionate about it because, you know, the skill set you have, you can do something else. Uh, yeah. Because it's, it's a, it's a, to make it work, uh, it's, it's complex. Anyway, so, the, but the whole point is that, you know, what this is, it was the creator never, and never stopped to create, right? And I think this is what I'm the same time. You just do it. Yeah, you know, even Walt Disney, you know, he was broke. He had nothing, and he's still drawing and drawing and drawing. And there you go. Then the last cartoon that he did, one of the when he had nothing, then he drew Mickey Mouse, and the rest is history. So the creator never stopped to create. And another funny story is about you know I have a um, in London we take a lot of taxi. I don't drive, so uh, the cab company the I'm friend of all the drivers because you know they drive me around all the time and uh, some of them they have, they're like 60 70 and all of them happen to have houses in Spain but I thought today no I have a house in Spain with the sea and everything and then I told one of the guy look why you don't go to retire why are you doing driving this thing every night you know you can go on and be in the beach in Spain and retire what are you doing here and the guy told me Harry Listen to me, the, the last cab driver that retired from, from the hub died, you know. So I'm not <laughs> retired. It's every time that somebody retires after two years, they die. So you know, I'm still driving. And so it's it's like the uh the you know the the story of the shark, right? The shark, if it's not moving, it stops, yeah. you know, it, it dies because it needs the the exactly. water oxygen flowing yeah. through its gills. Yeah. yeah. I think the other thing that's motivating, and you've you've probably seen this as well, like if you've had a certain amount of success at a certain amount of scale, there's almost this reinforcing loop that you're like, man, could I have done it bigger? Or was there another? And I think there's a lot of sort of highly successful folks who have sort of self-doubt or things that are become primary motivators for them, right? Like you doubted me here. I doubted myself here. How do I do better at the next thing? So yes, you know, maybe this one exited at a 10 million. Well, the next one I want takes at 50 and the next one a hundred, mm -hmm. right? And so you take creator plus there's just a lot of like, um, it's, it's like a, a competition oriented mindset or an athlete oriented mindset where you just kind of want to be the best at what you're doing. And so you get the creativity and the persistence, but also a highly competitive nature. Mm -hmm. But then Lucas, the, let's talk about that, about the mindset, because, you know, when, when you have an startup at the beginning and nobody knows you, it's hard to find the first client it's difficult to to go through, especially if you're starting out and and you don't know um, not too many not too many things. Even you, with, with all the experience in Amazon and so on, when you start your first comp, start top by yourself, you had to take a lot in. It's a lot of pressure. Yeah. So it's a lot of negative baggage that goes to to your brain, right? Things are not working. Frustration, money, take as you know, it's really expensive. So money disappears like water. Uh, you make a mistake, ten thousand gone. You make another mistake, fifty k gone, and moving yeah. back. Is this this the nature of tech? You know, it's expensive. 
So all this frustration, negative back that accumulated in, in your brain, um, you know, uh, if you don't find a way to work on yourself, to kind of analyze, I see you with very good energy, you're smiling, you're calm, you don't look stressed out to me, despite the running at the company, which is very rare. <laughs> so, yeah. the, uh, so what you do, tell us the secret, how you work on yourself. Do you swim? Do you walk? Do you read the book? You naturally like that? Or how you discover that you have to, to work on yourself to release all this negative baggage to allow yeah. a good thing? Because the problem that we find not only taking entrepreneurs, with them entrepreneurs out there, is that you know they have that ego that they want to run the business and they want to stick to the idea and then they are working Monday to Sunday, uh, twelve hours a day. Um, they are getting angry. They don't have time to spend with the family, with the friends, and they have problems with relationship with the children and so on. And this emotional pain also can lead to physical pain. People can end up with cancer, heart attack, you name it. Yeah. They I, I interview a serial entrepreneur like you that the guy was vomiting blood, and he was a yeah. multi-millionaire with several business making a lot of money and he was literally vomiting blood because uh, he couldn't you know because of the nature of handling the business and right. everything uh, until the guy said you know how to stop this because because the business literally can kill you you know my business my first business when i did a property me a, a company that we have like we sold like five million uh, I had too many clients and they all want to talk to me and I'm telling to my team, listen, they cannot all talk to me. It's all of them yeah. to me that will kill me. I cannot sleep. <laughs> They're too many. <laughs> they yeah. will kill me. They are a lot. And uh, that's what I was saying to, to the thing. So the business literally can kill you. So what do you do? So you running the business rather than the business running you because literally can kill you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of it, even independent of things you do outside of the business is where you can figure out where you can empower people and create autonomy for those people. So every organization I've had, uh, you know, I'm big investing into team members and giving them some sort of ro rope maybe to hang themselves, but it's a lot of opportunity to learn. You know, I had a call with two of my engineers before hopping on with you. And I said, look, I'm somewhat abdicating the responsibility here, what a product manager would generally do and you as a software engineer generally wouldn't do, but I want you to go ahead and take a stab at it. Um, I just saved myself hour, hour and a half of time on doing that project. It may take him two times that, three times that, but he learns a lot in the process and I'm using that time on other high leverage value things, including hopping on and talking with you, right? So yeah. I think a lot of it is Thank like, you. just knowing that you can't, you can't do everything. So like businesses generally only scale when they build teams around them and you find people that you trust and you give them the authority to make decisions, et cetera. So I'm a big fan of that. You know, I was, my CTO was my VP of engineering at my last company and we have a long relationship with each other. We trust each other. I can say, okay, I can't worry about this right now. Or I'm not sure I can even understand what you're saying. <laughs> I just trust you to make the right decision. <laughs> and you come back to me and give me updates as necessary. So I think a lot of it is having, um, you know, trust in team, which is a big part of hiring people that you can have trust in, right? Um, and then I think outside of the organization, there is, you know, there's sort of like stoic oriented mindset of, you know, we're all going to die at some point. Mm -hmm. um, and some of these things um, are maybe not worth worrying about quite as much and giving yourself that perspective occasionally. And beating yourself up, um, right? Yeah. And then the other is like, I, I just read voraciously and I actually listen to a ton of podcasts and a lot oh, of it wow. is success stories, but I tend to like the success stories that get into the background of the challenges that they had to go through first. So I don't like the clean narrative arc of everything just seems to work out. I, I kind of like the ones where there's tons of bumps along the way and there was a success story at the end or how they manage um, their their life. So, you know, Andy Dunn, who is the Bonobos, uh, the gene company founder, was like struggling with extreme depression while he was launching that business. Well, mm -hmm. he came out and he wrote a book about it afterwards when he sold it to Amazon saying, these are the things I was going through. Hopefully you too, if you're going through them, 
you should go through these things because I had to be committed for a period of time because I wasn't taking care of myself to your point around the entrepreneur vomiting blood. So like I use those as a good sort of touchstone or, or like visual milestone or just a reference point to say like, I should not be doing that thing mm -hmm. or this seems, seems to be working really well for them. So for me, it's like, uh, just, I, I, I'm an, a big sort of consumer of the fire hose of information of life. And part of that's positive psychology and part of that's, you know, comparative religion and part of that's a number of things, but don't let like my own facade trick you because I am definitely the duck placid on top and the legs are going crazy underneath the water um, because I too have a thousand things kind of running in my mind at any given moment. But I do try to make sure that I have perspective on what I'm building and knowing finite time and family is important and all those sorts of other things. And I have a, a forgiving family. My eight-year-old, you know, wow. I'm actively working at my new fundraise and he says, Wow. Daddy, do you have another, do you have another deadline? And I'm like, yeah, buddy, <laughs> I got another deadline. Um, Daddy, can we go, can we go play for 10 minutes and then you continue with your deadline? Yeah, buddy, we can do that. Right. So like uh, just getting a family that's supportive and getting them to understand that, you know, a lot of this is for them where you want to instill the same sort of motivations and goals in them as well. So yeah. I don't know, I find family and just continuing to, to, um, consume are like are primary motivators for me to kind of keep balance, but I also have a therapist. I also take medication. Like I'm doing other things that are lifelong battles that, you know, you probably know this. There's a high proclivity for depression and anxiety amongst entrepreneurs. Oh, tell me so about it. Handle, handle those things, right? Uh, I have to walk. I, I, I walk a lot a daily. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's allow me to to release, to stay calm, to, I mean, this is, this is part of the nature. This is, it's part of the process. So, um uh we do have to i i learned this uh you no know, my early years of entrepreneur there were a lot of anxiety i got anger i got everything because i i couldn't find a way to to re to to release all this negative baggage that's why i'm asking you the question so then i experienced myself right and uh, at the yeah. beginning I was angry frustrated tired I'm, i don't have money i have to do everything i of course i am angry i'm not sleeping you know yeah i'm making money but <laughs> uh, i'm tired so to the point that until we started to hire people and uh which he was i was resisted to it i want to do everything by myself but at some point say, okay let me start to hire people i'll find out something amazing everybody that i had was better than me at, at everything to the point that one day Uh, I went to the office and they told me, Harry, go home. We don't need you. We can run this company without you. I'm like, what? You don't need paper in the photocopy? <laughs> no, we don't need paper in the photocopy. We can get our own paper in the photocopy. Go home. And literally they sent me home. Yeah. So. <laughs> that's so, a good, that's a good uh, thing. Yeah. They were all better than me at everything. There was, there was nothing I could do that they couldn't do better. But um I remember that somehow I create this this spirit in the company because when I was in the office, I remember that I put a sign that I said, okay, don't come to ask me a question if you don't have a solution. Try bring two or three solutions and come and ask me whatever question you want. I, I was trying to tell them, look, I'm only one person. All of you coming to ask me a question, you're going to drive me crazy. Try to bring the solution. And then they start to come to bring the solutions And then I was telling them, okay, choose which one do you prefer? I said, why I should choose? You choose anyway. Either I choose or you choose. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, we have to do it again. So who cares who chooses? What do you think? That are, are the three solutions you propose? What do you think? You choose. So yeah. to the point that I create this type of culture. And yeah, after a few months, <laughs> I was not needed anymore. Even in the office, was uh, was the point to ask anything to Harry, and you know he's gonna tell me to do the solution and to pick my own. So what, what was the point? So they create that autonomy. And this is my next question, Lucas. In your opinion, um, I ask a lot of tech entrepreneurs, successful like you, um, if they had to start all over again, what they will do. Some of them have telling me that if they need to start uh, all over again, they will put more attention to the culture of the company yeah is that yeah. your case um uh, or you oh, oh you are aware that every time that you um that you start a new venture 
poachers is very important and you keep yeah. uh, hiring a line and you keep this team alive because uh, I got a, a lot of um, taking the pronoun. So what's your view on culture? Is it really that important? Is it not important? Uh, what is your, your view on this? Yeah, I think it's a good question. Um, I happened again, because I was at Amazon during sort of like a formative period of my life and culture was really key there. And for some folks, they felt like it was a toxic culture and it wasn't a good fit for them. For other folks, they excelled. So, you know, bias for action being one of their leadership principles, disagree and commit being one of their principles. A lot of things were designed to allow for like moving really quickly and also allowing for the fact that like disagreements may exist, but you have to get over whatever it is and commit to a solution because otherwise you're just going to be fighting yourselves endlessly. You're not going to, you're going to get caught in analysis paralysis. So my last business, I actually had hired an organizational psychologist who had a PhD in organizational psychology. He stuttered under uh, Mihai, a very long check last name. I can't remember who wrote the book flow around, you know, positive psychology oh, wow. and flow. And so he came in and he helped me think about exactly what it was that, you know, we wanted to stand for and then how we wanted to live and like operate our business. And we did a bunch of uh, interviews of the staff and we walked away with some things that I wouldn't have anticipated. One of which was um, care for the communal. And another one was embrace the humor. Um, the former was because he noticed through all the interviews we did of the staff that they were making a lot of expressions of concerns for one another and each other's well-being and supporting one another, but also the vendors that we worked with because they knew they were going to have long-standing relationships with them or the customers that we hoped to have multiple year relationships with. Um, so we would often think about like, are we doing these things in a multi-stakeholder fashion where we're caring for the entire community, right? Or the embracing the humor went a long way. I tease myself. I'm highly def self self deprecating in public forums, and I'm okay with that, right? And and it helps. Or cracking jokes because it adds levity and in moments of tension, right? Um, so yeah, I definitely think they're they're important. And I, I think you also through culture you learn things like your example of the sort of solutions oriented approach of, hey, you guys have a lot of knowledge amongst yourself. I don't have to be the blocker on all these things, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Amazon often would time would talk about one way door decisions versus two way door decisions. And Jeff Wilkie, who ended up being the consumer CEO of the company, was my senior vice president. And when I went to raise money for my last business, we shot him an email and said, "Hey, you know, can we get together to pitch you on it?" And he responded in under ten minutes. This is the consumer CEO of Amazon who had like one point five million people working for him responding to me in sub ten minutes. And I said. Jeff, how do you accomplish that? And he said, because I pushed all the decisions down that are possible and trust the people that are possible. And then if they hit something that appears to be a one-way door decision that's going to be almost intractable to like get out of, they surface that to me and then we have conversations. But otherwise, I'm able to spread myself really widely because I'm only focusing on those things. And I, I love that, introducing that sort of mentality into like my current company. You know, folks are... Is this the right marketing copy or is this the right marketing copy or is this text versus this text? And I'm like, this is a two-way door decision. You can do it. We can push code tomorrow that changes it, right? So, um, yes, I think culture is uh, immensely important. And especially with younger millennials and Gen Z where sort of culture probably comes above all else now, they'll take culture over pay. They'll yeah. take culture over specific yeah. benefits, right? So Agony, you have to be yeah. caught have to be cognizant of that as you're building a business, even if you're an older generation, that this is, you know, the vast majority of employees now and they mm -hmm. care about culture. So you, you have to care about culture. It's not a choice. Mm -hmm. um, and, and not having some sense for it. So like the newer business I'm doing now, like we haven't codified everything just yet, but we're basically using the, the cultural sort of landmarks we had from the previous company because mm -hmm. they worked really well. So we've reemphasized them, but I also want to make sure that the new company has a sense for itself and so we'll do an exercise like do these do we really believe these things do you think these things are going to motivate us in the way that we we want to do they stand for like do they represent what we stand for so yes i'm definitely a big culture advocate and i think a big part of it harry is also um culture advocacy or culture in general is also about narrative and stories and humanity is built around stories uh, mm -hmm. contracts are stories 
you know, religion in some form or another stories, Gover governments are stories, right? So you have to create stories that you rally around. You have to create <laughs> stories that people believe and culture is that story. So yes, yeah. I definitely believe culture matters immensely. Mm. Thank you so much. And then Lucas, tell us about the new company. Tell us why. Yeah, uh, yeah we, we love to hear about the new company. What, what is going to be? What, what problem is solving? Uh, yeah, I appreciate it. Us. So Deepcast is, um, I mentioned this earlier, the whole the mission statement there is unlocking the value of the world's spoken knowledge. Um, we, we kind of reference, um, you and I are old enough to remember sort of the internet of the 90s. And so like imagine when the internet was closed and it had no search and had no sharing. This is like pre-Google, pre-Web 2.0 with Facebook and services. I, our argument was that our thesis is that that's kind of where podcasting still is today, despite oh, yeah. the fact that there are four and four and a half million podcasts, despite the fact that there's 550 million global listeners of podcasts. Yet the smaller is out, the smaller, the least developed um... media ecosystem. And, and that was sort of our thesis. We we're like, why is it this way? And so we said we should come here. We want to structure the data, index the data, graph the data, distill the data, make the data more interactive. So the output of things you and I are saying, I want to get the text out of it. I want to load it into a data set. I want to enable that to help listeners with discovery and engagement. They want to go back and they want to read the transcript because Harry said that really heartwarming thing and they want to be able to share it with their team because they're driving culture. Wow. Or mm -hmm. they want to be able to share uh, an episode with a friend. The, you know, it's a Lex Friedman episode that's eight hours long. Do they really want to invest in that? They can read some distilled information to drive those decisions. They're really into podcasts X, Y, and Z. We topically categorize those so they can use those to identify other things that might be interesting. So I call it like organic serendipity, but there's just a ton of information these days. Like some of the best discourse that's happening is happening in podcasts. Hmm. You know, you, you got, uh, or, or some minor variants, but for the most part, you know, if you look at Lex, he had senior U.S. folks running for office on his show or Kara Swisher or Joe Rogan, or the list goes on and on. But how do I get that out of there in a way that I can also leverage for other purposes? Um, so we think of our business as one for listeners and creating this amazing sort of like discovering distillation. Another one for podcasters where we're helping you do those things. You create the show. Let us help you promote it, market, and monetize it beyond that. Oh, amazing. Because you want, we want this to be a recurring thing for you. Like you can create not just a hobby out of it, but a business out of it, right? And then there's a third tier of this business, Harry, which is a longer term strategy around the information that's in there could be used for media marketing, uh, sorry, media monitoring, brand mo monitoring. Think like um, I am Apple and I'm a brand manager owned Vision Pro. Vision Pro 2 comes out. How's the market responding to it? Well, guess where that those conversations are happening? They're happening in podcasts. Oh, wow. It's, Amazing. This is very powerful. It's, wow. Yes. So and we are, the goal is to build the corpus of data bigger and bigger, structure it more and more, and then have, to my point earlier around, sometimes things are like multifaceted and you might have multiple revenue new lines based upon some core idea. And our core idea is that there's rich information here. How do we get it to each of these respective audiences who want it? Hmm. So Deepcast is uh, roughly a year old now and uh, uh, kind of started hitting our stride about three or four months ago. If folks are looking for podcasts like yours or otherwise, mm -hmm. I definitely suggest going to deepcast.fm and give it a try. The, uh, definitely the need is there because like, like I was saying, in our research, what it shows is that the The podcast is um is is really raw. It's um like for example, uh we have people was watching TV, right? And then um they change to YouTube and a lot of people, especially young generation, consume a lot of content, video content through YouTube, right? Now, on the same way that um there are more visual people, right? The auditories, but a lot of people that actually Auditory, so they prefer to consume the content just by, by in audio fashion. Yeah, in the car or in the gym. They don't necessarily, they don't like to consume content just by watching the video. And uh, yeah, so this market is on the self at the, at the moment, is what our, our research show. That's why we're doing the podcast. Yeah, <laughs> in the first place. Uh, but it's, 
yeah. it's also it's also a growing marketplace. So I alluded mm -hmm. to the fact that it's you know five hundred fifty million, but it was somewhere less than two hundred million six years ago. And the the projections and for it to be over a billion global users in the next yeah, two yeah, years, yeah. Mm -hmm. and so that's just on the listener side. But then you also see the business opportunity for marketers. You know this probably through your research that podcast listeners tend to be slightly more affluent than any other media mm -hmm. type. Mm -hmm. um, business decision makers are listening at higher propensities. So if you're a marketer, you're brand marketing your goods. You should be putting dollars to work here because guess what? They trust Harry. They trust Lex, they trust Joe, they trust like podcasters are considered the most trustworthy amongst all the media types right now. Mm -hmm. So that's where you want to put brand dollars to work. And if you got a billion people, you know, 40% 40, 40 of adults in Indonesia listening, and it's the fourth largest economy in the world, you need a, a, an entire infrastructure to be able to support putting ad dollars to work there and supporting those people on discovery. So it's just the pithy version is I feel like podcasting is like, 10 years it's it's caught 10 years in the past versus yeah, every yeah. other media so how do we bring technology of all sorts to all the stakeholders to enable the entire thing to get bigger and enable you know more livelihoods to be created profitability to be created and then just satisfied users and, and like spread of knowledge i really love sort of perplexity um the the um, answer bot or you know competitor to google the idea of like staying curious always staying curious and like this platform is just designed to to beget curiosity through the spread of knowledge but there's plenty of opportunities to make money for multiple stakeholders in, in the process as well and we want to facilitate all of them i agree wow i think that you love this you as usual love this up to something huge, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. No wonder. Yeah. So, Lucas, thank you so much for your time, which we know that is very valuable uh, by staying with us and overall to share so, uh, so much valuable content with our audience. We really appreciate um, uh, your kindness. Yeah. No, I appreciate and, it. Uh, and uh, any support that you need for your project, uh, can you please repeat the website for... Of fellow podcasters and and the listeners, what is the website? Sure. And give it a try. Yeah, I'll definitely do it. So for listeners, go to www.deepcast.fm. That's D E E P cast. So like podcast. So deepcast.fm. And then if you're a podcaster, it's deepcast.pro. So both of those websites are uh, available for each of the respective audiences. And if you're a podcaster, I also suggest you check out deepcast.fm because you can see how other podcasts are better doing things with the data on there as well. So mm -hmm. definitely check them both out. So deepcast.pro and deepcast.fm. Thank you so much, Lucas. And on that note, see you guys in our next episode of Unstoppable, how brave entrepreneurs like Lucas break that wall and achieve the first million. Bye for now. All right. All right. Appreciate it. Thanks, Harry. Thank you. Follow us for more interviews with world's most influential, audacious entrepreneurs that overcame challenges and adversity, providing you with the blueprint of how they sold their first million so you can grow your business exponentially.